of us who are old timers in the movement will remember how the premier libertarian magazine in fact started as a little, little newsletter just duplicated, um, which although always having an impressive content in format to begin with was, was um, rather amateur. I think this in fact sums up Robert Paul's strengths that from whereas other libertarian organizations have tended to throw a lot of money um, into glossy formats and so on, and then only survived a few years. Uh, Robert and his colleagues at Reason have built up a really enduring organization, um, which is, to my mind, perhaps you know, the core of the libertarian movement. Moreover, they've done so um, without being excessively factional, uh, without being devious, <laughs> and in fact being really nice guys. <laughs> On top of that, Robert is, to my mind, at least perhaps, although other people lay claim to this title, but in my eyes, he really is Mr. Libertarian, uh, who combines the, the virtues of rationality, tolerance, uh, and commitment to principle. I hope I'm not embarrassing him too much by this encomium, but um, I think he deserves it. Um, Robert has written on a wide range of, of subjects. Um, of late, he's been interested uh, in defense issues, um, issues I certainly think um, need a lot more analysis, uh, a lot more rational analysis than they've received from many parts of the libertarian movement. And it's a great pleasure to introduce him today and to introduce him on the subject of defense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Can everyone at the back hear properly? Fine. National defense and the whole the subject of foreign policy generally, of which national defense is a part, is probably the most difficult and divisive issue that, that libertarians today face. It's, it's difficult and divisive for, for several reasons. For one thing, I suppose most of us were something else before being libertarians, either, either liberals in, in the American sense of that term or conservatives, and have tended, I think many of us, to carry along with us into being libertarians many ideas from our former uh, ideological stance without really rethinking them or thinking them through as to how seriously they agree with our overall libertarian principles. And in addition, defense concerns very difficult and emotional subjects, ones that uh, many of us have strong feelings about that uh, may precede our having become libertarians. So it's a difficult subject to think rationally and clearly about. It's also difficult because it's so complex and there's so much information needed to actually understand what's going on in the realm both of defense technology and in, in understanding which capabilities exist in which countries, what information is really propaganda, what is really fact. I think there's one final reason that uh, this is a difficult subject for libertarians, and that is because to the extent that we believe that there should be government functions at all, and, and I think most libertarians do, but not all, of course, do, uh, we, don't, we have very little thought about a, an actual theory of given that governments exist, what should they do? And if, if there's any proper function for a government, it, it certainly national defense is one of those functions. But it makes us uncomfortable to be putting out positive statements about what governments should do as opposed to negative statements about things that governments shouldn't do. So again, I think there's a, there's a reason there why we haven't paid as much attention to proper principles of national defense as we otherwise might have and have gone into issues like deregulation or selling off state-owned industries. This whole set of problems really bothered us at the Reason Foundation and about three years ago we decided to do a major project trying to come up with a, a proper formulation of principles for national defense and foreign policy. We put together a team of nine people from different fields people with defense technology backgrounds, people with economics, history, government backgrounds, all of whom share basic libertarian values. The result after some two years of work was 
this book, uh, Defending a Free Society, which has 11 chapters written by the nine people and which I didn't write any of, but I served as the overall project director and, and general editor. And what I will be saying this morning is a summary of some of the major principles and ideas that we came up with in this book. Let me say, as further preface, what this talk is not about and what the book is not about. I'm not going to be addressing what might exist in some ideal world of, of libertarian countries uh, dealing with other libertarian countries. That's a nice thing to speculate about, and it's something that someday maybe some of us or our, or our children will live to see. What I am going to be talking about is today's world as it exists with uh, a lot of dangerous situations, hostile powers and so forth, and large nation states as the, as the given reality. And the project for this book and for this talk is to talk about what can we as libertarians contribute to the debate on defense policy in the world as it exists to move things in the direction of a more libertarian world. In other words, just as we do, just as Madsen Peary said the other morning about making steps for domestic government policy that move in the direction of freedom and in the principles of liberty, similarly, we as libertarians ought to be able to apply our principles to make recommendations in defense and foreign policy that move existing free societies in the direction of further freedom in the area of defense and foreign policy. That's the kind of project, not how would defense be handled in an ideal libertarian world. That's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Now, there are three basic areas that I want to, to cover uh, just briefly. The first is the overall moral framework principles of moral philosophy that lie at the core of defense and foreign policy. Second is applying those principles to the very difficult issues of nuclear strategy. And the third point is to apply those principles to military alliances, all, all topics deserving of, of many hours in their own right. Let's plunge in and start, first of all, with talking about the moral framework that uh, that we should be looking at to, to figure out what to say about defense questions. Now, because I said we're starting with the world of, of governments as they exist today, so therefore we are going to be talking about, in a free, if, as a free society, what should government's role in national defense be? Our definition is that it should be to protect the rights and freedoms of the people who've hired it within a framework of law. Now, that is a very limited definition, uh, and it is not at all the kind of, of charges that uh, our existing governments in, in the United States or Western Europe give to themselves. The purpose of defense, then, can only be to defend against real threats to the lives, property, and freedoms of the people of a country whose, whose government we're talking about. Cannot be grandiose, collectivist kind of ideas that say lead the free world, protect vital interests, and make the world safe, these kinds of things that, that have led to, to grandiose crusades and gigantic levels of taxation in the past. Secondly, there's a question of jurisdiction. Where, where does this defense take place? Given that other governments exist around the world, and if we believe in the rule of law, uh, I think we, we need to, to acknowledge the reality of other governments and other legal systems existing. I think it's, it is consistent to say that, that the jurisdiction of national defense is properly to defend the territory of, the ver of whatever society we're talking about, and not to be trying to right wrongs that exist within other countries. On the other hand, that principle alone doesn't say, doesn't restrict defense operations outside strictly the borders of a given country, assuming that country is a free society that we're talking about. Uh, there are large areas that are beyond the jurisdiction of any government, the high seas, outer space being specifics that I have in mind. And 
we know, I know of no principle that says that uh, it violates anyone's rights or jurisdiction to have defensive operations taking place on the seas, defensive operations taking place in outer space. And, and as we will see in, in further discussion, such things can play a vital role in serious, realistic national defense. Now, a third point is what kind of means can be used? If we're, if we're talking about a free society, what kind of means can be used in the name of national defense? Does, is, anything, is it an anything-goes situation as long as the, the goal is to defend the lives and freedom of, of the people within the free society? I don't think so. The means, obviously, libertarians are people who believe that the principle of means justifying, of ends justifying the means is wrong. Obviously, the means must be consistent with the ends. If we're talking about defending freedom, it's completely illegitimate to violate freedom in order to do that. And that means that, uh, for example, such commonly accepted things as, as conscription of drafting people against their will to provide a means of defense we cannot uh, agree with as libertarians. Ultimately, the same argument applies to drafting or conscripting people's money. Uh, you cannot be consistent in principle to defend freedom by taking away other people's freedom. On the other hand, let me, let me make the point that it is possible to separate the issue of what kind of, of forces and functions, what kind of actions in uh, preparing for war or in preparing to defend a society uh, it is legitimate for government to take. In other words, the operational aspects of, of military strategy, force structure, and so forth. That's a, di a separate question, a separable question from the issue of how does defense get paid for. And so within the scope of the Reason Foundation's project and within the scope of this book and my talk this morning, I am not going to be trying to solve the very naughty problem of voluntary financing of defense. That's a subject that we are planning further research on at the Reason Foundation. We did not find any well-worked-out theories. Uh, we found a few sketchy ideas on voluntary financing of defense. Uh, and so we did not feel comfortable putting out to the world for general public consumption half-baked ideas on voluntary financing. We identified it as a problem and said this is something that needs further work. In the meantime, we go on to look at the questions of how to properly versus improperly use military force in the defense of freedom. So that's a very important qualification. Finally, then, we come to the question of when to use military force. When is it justified to act in the name of national defense? And how do we decide that? And this really has two parts. One is, is when is it justified to, to get into a situation of actually using force, and once you do, what are the principles that govern how you use that force? Now, those two questions constitute a branch of moral philosophy, a branch of political philosophy, that historically has gone by the name of just war theory. Some people have an instinctive negative reaction against the term because they don't like to really think that, about war and justice in the same breath. But that's the, that's the traditional name for this branch of, of political philosophy, so I think we might as well use it. Now, in our book, in our project, we looked at seven possible alternative theories of, of just war, of what are the moral principles involved for using military defensive force, ranging all the way from principled pacifism on one end to the idea that once you're attacked, then anything goes, it's life or death, and, and there are no governing, restraining moral principles. And evaluating the, uh, the rationality, the consistency of all those positions, we came out at, some, at one of the intermediate positions as being the most justified, and we call that a just war defense principle. Basically, it says that the limitation on using force in self-defense is, is the following, that all defensive force must be targeted against aggressive force. Now that sounds like a very simple principle, but if, as soon as you start talking about applying that to real world situations, you immediately come up against some tough moral dilemmas. What if the aggressive force that's launched against you is made up entirely of conscripts, people who are there against their will? Is it still justified to shoot back? Are those aggressive forces in the sense that we, that we mean? What if the aggressor 
uses human shields. And even so far as to go as literally to, to strap human beings on the front of, of his tanks and, and roll those tanks against you with the idea that that will prevent you as a moral person from shooting back. What if the uh, aggressor, by design, places his, his rocket launchers, his gun emplacements in the midst of civilian villages with the idea that you as a moral person will therefore not shoot back because you, by doing so you would, you would in, inevitably be wiping out innocent civilians. What about those questions? Well, if you think those problems through, my conclusion, the conclusion that we reached in our project team was that you have to cope with those moral dilemmas and that the only coherent, consistent way of coping with them, other than going back to a principled pacifism which says that you really basically cannot defend yourself and that uh, uh, you, you have no right to retaliate. The only coherent answer to those questions is that you must be able to shoot back in those tough situations of conscripts, human shields, or innocent bystanders. But uh, you have a moral obligation to do so in the least destructive way, the way that minimizes all possible harm to innocent bystanders to, uh, to human shield. The moral responsibility for harm that occurs to, to the conscripts, to human shields, to innocent bystanders, rests on the shoulders of the aggressor who has put those innocent people in that position uh, by his own actions. It, is not, it does not rest on your shoulders as someone who is simply trying to defend himself against that tough situation. But obviously, as moral people, as morally responsible people, if a gun emplacement is in the midst of a village, we don't want to shoot back with something that, uh, uh, by definition, wipes out the whole village. We want to shoot back with something that does the best job possible of hitting the gun emplacement with as little harm to the surrounding innocents as possible. So that's the kind of general principle that we've come up with. And think about it. Let's go back one more time to, to the alternative to that. If you are not willing... To, to respond with defensive force when the aggressor uses those, those very vicious and evil techniques of, of re relying on your sense of morality to avoid killing the, the innocent people that he puts in your way, then you have left yourself completely open to being wiped out by the most ruthless of aggressors. Because if the, if the, the aggressor knows that that's your moral position, then all he has to do in order to guarantee winning is to be as, as ruthless and evil as possible, to use only conscripts, to always use human shields, to always place his aggressive force in the midst of, of civilian uh, concentrations, knowing that thereby you can do nothing. So I think you know, once, you, once you realize this moral dilemma, you really are faced with either being strictly a pacifist or being willing to respond in, the, in accordance with the guidelines that I've just laid down. Now, the implications of these moral principles are very far-reaching. These can be applied directly to both nuclear and conventional arms strategy, tactics, and, and types of weapon systems that people would procure. The general principles, before going into details, are because of these moral dilemmas about potentially wiping out many civilians, obviously you will prefer shields to swords. You would prefer to be able to ward off blows as much as possible rather than having to retaliate in situations where you might kill many innocent bystanders. Uh, so that certainly says that you would want to have things like anti-ballistic missile systems and civil defense and other protective measures uh, rather than relying strictly and solely on retaliation. But secondly, uh, the other implication that I draw is that it is morally acceptable to retaliate and that therefore you also, besides defensive shield types of, of systems and procedures, obviously you also need retaliatory forces, but retaliatory forces that can be used in a discriminating way, They're, therefore they should be as accurate as possible, and with the amount of, of destructive power that's proportionate to the task at hand, and not any more than that. And that poses some very definite constraints on what kinds of weapon systems you uh, purchase and how you use them in, if you ever have to use them. Now, if you contrast these general ideas with the principles that have governed nuclear strategy in, in the last 
30 years, the general principle has been called mutual assured destruction, which is the idea, which is the idea of that the only real defense should be massive retaliation uh, of, of a sort that is so horrible because it's premised on, on destroying the, the enemy's society with massive nuclear attacks. Uh, it's, that, that kind of philosophy is exactly the opposite of what I have just laid out as being in accordance with libertarian principles. Uh, the mutual assured destruction philosophy stresses large city-busting nuclear types of weapons as opposed to highly accurate, small-scale, discriminate types of weapons. So we have very much of, of opposing philosophies here, contending for, for the allegiance of libertarians. Let me also, as a footnote, note that uh, this problem, the moral dilemma of, of hitting innocent bystanders in retaliation against an enemy uh, uh, aggressive missile silo or whatever, is really not a problem that arises only in, in nuclear strategy. Any sort of, of response to aggression, whether it's a tank crew firing against uh, an enemy tank or against enemy soldiers, whether it's even a rifleman aiming a rifle, has the same moral dilemma built in. There's always the possibility, uh, and in some cases probability, of innocent bystanders, of civilians, being in the vicinity and possibly being hit by accident. And so you can't escape this dilemma by, by trying to uninvent nuclear weapons and saying that it only arises because of the nuclear age. This is a problem that's inherent in any kind of armed conflict. It's not strictly a matter of, of nuclear policy. All right, let me, let me now move from the moral philosophy into trying to apply these ideas a little bit more in detail to the nuclear strategy question. What is fascinating to, to be aware of here, and, and much of the nuclear debate today acts as if many of these facts weren't true, is that there has been a tremendous technological revolution in nuclear armaments over the last 30 years. Back in the 1950s, the only kind of, of nuclear strategy was city busting. The, the nuclear weapons that existed then were huge multi-megaton bombs that were carried on bombers that were dropped by gravity with very large inaccuracy. I mean, if you hit something within a mile, you were, you were doing good. Um, through the development of ICBMs and today with, with even more precise missiles and guidance systems, it is now possible to hit targets over long distances, even intercontinental distances, within a few hundred feet. And with cruise missiles and the kind of, of uh, guidance, of active guidance systems that they now have, it's possible literally within, within tens of feet to hit targets. Now that makes possible things that just were not even conceivable 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, you, can, you can measure some of, of the change that's gone on by, by looking at the size of nuclear arsenals. The U.S. nuclear arsenal, measured in terms of the megatonnage, uh, millions of tons of explosive power, of, of the total set of bombs that exist, in 1980 was only one quarter as much megatonnage as in 1960. Few people are aware of that, but that's because of this progressive miniaturization of nuclear warheads because of more accurate guidance systems uh, and more precise means of delivery. Uh, this, prog this process is continuing. The technology is not at all static. Uh, every, it's, it's sort of like in computers, the miniaturization of computing power, uh, the same sort of thing, although not quite as dramatic, has been going on and still is going on in nuclear weapons. Uh, since 1967, the United States government has phased out two nuclear warheads or weapons for every new one uh, that's been added. So there's been a very large change going on over these years. The ironic thing about this is that a number of libertarians, at least in the United States, favor the idea that's very popular of a nuclear freeze, which would have a treaty negotiated between the United States and the Soviet Union that would call a halt to all development of nuclear weapons. It would say, whatever you have today, stop and maintain that as your nuclear arsenal. Well, the U.S. nuclear arsenal and the Soviet nuclear arsenal still contain hundreds of, of very, very large, inaccurate nuclear weapons, multi-megaton type city busters. 
that are still there in the arsenal. The nuclear freeze would guarantee that those, those awful weapons that cannot be used in a discriminatory manner, those would have to remain in the nuclear arsenal. Uh, so I think libertarians really need to question that idea uh, as much as, as on first glance it may sound like a, a move toward, toward peace of some sort, uh, it would in fact call a halt to this tremendous technological evolution that's been going on and that is continuing uh, and which is moving us in the direction of, of a, making possible a much more principled uh, set of, of doctrines and tactics for the use of nuclear weapons. Now, I said a few minutes ago that according to the moral principles that I laid out, we should prefer shields to swords, uh, and that ideally a, a weapons, a defensive system would consist of a combination of defenses and precision retaliatory forces. Now, what kind of, what would that consist of in fact? What could that consist of and what's technologically possible? You've all heard a great deal about Star Wars uh, and uh, in, in the year and a half since President Reagan announced a, at least a rhetorical commitment to building nuclear defenses in the United States, the idea has been given a lot of play and a lot of attack. Last week's Economist has this uh, lead editorial or, or leader, as I guess you call them in this country, uh, about space weapons and, and makes the, uh, what are now the conventional arguments, three different arguments saying why this is a bad idea. Well. I happen to think that, that all three of those arguments are wrong, and I will, I will tell you briefly why. The most, probably the most persuasive argument uh, against de nuclear defenses is the idea that uh, unless a defensive shield of, some, of a set of anti-ballistic missile weapons, unless it's practically perfect, it's not worth doing. Well, there's two things wrong with that. First of all, many of the people who make that argument argue that... Uh, there is no likely technological way to get 90 or 95 percent uh, perfection, let's say. 90 or 90 percent, 90 or 95 percent interception of all the attacking warheads or missiles. Uh, now, in the first place, what, what that idea ignores, that, that, that is based on the common sense idea that it's very expensive to get uh, 98 or 99 percent reliability or, or quality in any sort of, of system, and that this is a very complex technological problem, which it is, uh, and that it's, so it's, it's could only possibly be done at a huge cost more than anyone would want to afford. What this ignores is that all the proposals that are being seriously talked about call for doing the job in several layers, not having one system that has to be 90 or 95 percent effective, but having several different systems in sequence, in, in layers, if you will. Let's, let's think about the mathematics for a minute. Let's assume that we can build three different types of ABM technologies, one to intercept missiles in their launch phase, one to intercept them in the coasting ballistic phase, and the third to intercept the warheads on reentry. Okay, that's, <clears throat> those are the kinds of things that are being seriously talked about. Let's assume further that we don't ask for 95 or 99 percent uh, interception capability on any of those, but we only ask for 90% capability on each of the three layers. Suppose a, a massive attack from the Soviet Union were launched, say, against the United States of 5,000 5, missiles attack. If the first layer uh, is 90% effective and hits 90% of the boosters in their boost phase, that lets 10% through, or 500. Now you have 500 coasting through space and uh, the second layer, which is 90% effective, uh, again, hits 90% of those 500. That leaves 10% or 50 to re-enter the atmosphere and be, be attacking. Now, 50 is still a lot. The third layer, by again, by assumption, is 90% effective, uh, hits 90% of those 50, which leaves 10% or 5. Okay, five nuclear warheads landing on any country, even this country as large as the United States, is still a lot of destruction, but it's not 5,000. And five nuclear warheads produce a certain amount of blast and fallout, uh, and the areas that they hit as ground zero will certainly be destroyed. 
but the amount of fallout and, and collateral damage from five nuclear warheads is something that can easily be protected against with fallout shelters and other relatively modest forms of civil defense, far less extensive civil defense than is in place in present in Sweden and Switzerland and, and several other countries. So the idea of uh, a coordinated effort of, of civil defense and several layer defensive technology uh, is an eminently feasible one and reduces what would be a massive destruction of a country to a serious problem, but not at all the, the end of civilization or the, or the wipeout of a country. And so by proper understanding of the, of the technology and of how to put the thing together, I think you can see that something can be less than 100% perfect and still be very valuable to do, still provide very valuable amount of defense. Now, another, another objection that's raised, that's raised in the Economist editorial and raised in, in the United States, is that maybe it's doable, but it's far too costly, and, and it would be a waste of money uh, because it would cost $200 billion, $300 billion, $500 billion. Now, I'm not going to dispute that sort of, of ballpark of the numbers because I think to do a, a full-fledged three-layer system over a period of 10 or 15 years probably would cost in the range of 250 to 500 billion dollars to protect a country the size of the United States. But what you have to ask, uh, in the same way that Walter Williams asked yesterday about uh, the, the nurses' salaries, you have to ask compared to what? All right? Say, let's say 300 billion dollars over, over a 10-year period compared to what? Right now, the U.S. defense budget is, is close to, uh, it's between 200 and 300 billion a year over the next five years. And it's not providing any real defense. It's providing a huge amount of potential retaliation. It's providing all sorts of tanks for Europe and so forth, but it's not providing one, one ounce of protection for the United States against a nuclear attack. So to spend what would amount to maybe 10% or 15% of that budget uh, per year to build a real capability to defend against an all-out destruction seems to me to be an eminently reasonable proposition and not at all a, a kind of expense that bankrupts the country. And you also have to look at <clears throat> would you keep everything else the same or would you make other changes, reduce other things <clears throat> in order to have, in order to make affordable the kind of expenditure needed for this sort of system, and I think clearly you could and should. A third, a third kind of argument, uh, and this is a little more sophisticated one, is that building defenses against a nuclear attack is too dangerous a thing to do. It's provocative, it's destabilizing, uh, it would provoke the Soviet Union. Now, I think if you carry that kind of logic to its ultimate conclusion, it would say that uh, anything that you do to defend yourself is dangerous and would provoke the Soviet Union, so why not give up now uh, rather, than, rather than bothering going through the motions of spending the money and building systems. But the specifics of that argument are that an effective capability to defend against nuclear attack would amount to imposing disarmament on the Soviet Union, and therefore the Soviets, seeing that coming, would launch a preemptive attack before you got it built. Now, the same people who make that argument are the people who have been arguing over the last 10 years that no new offensive nuclear weapons systems should be built, such as the MX missile, the Trident submarine, the B-1 bomber, because the United States already possesses so much retaliatory power on its submarine force that uh, the Soviets would never attack, and even if they launched a first strike, they could be retaliated against with the submarine launch missile, and therefore uh, it would be suicidal for them to launch an attack, and so on and so forth. So these same people on the one hand are saying that, that the United States is so safe with its existing weapons that uh, the Soviets would never launch a nuclear attack, and now they're saying that with those same weapons in place, the Soviets would launch a nuclear attack, if the United States started to build a shield. And I think that is not really credible to maintain both things, things simultaneously. The other point to keep in mind about this is that what those critics are arguing is that the possession of, a, of the upper hand, let's say, 
uh, that, that a defensive shield, if the U.S. had a defensive shield and the Soviets didn't, this would give the United States government the ability to launch a first strike uh, without necessarily being wiped out in return. Uh, that was the case all through the 1950s and to about the end of the 1960s. The United States government had what was considered clear-cut nuclear superiority for two decades and did not use it and, and uh, this did not provoke World War III. And so I think to argue that to go go back, in a sense, to a situation where the United States government had nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union would not necessarily, I mean, you cannot assume that the fact of nuclear superiority on one side would lead to, to war, because for 20 years when that situation existed, it did not lead to war. In fact, it preserved peace. So the, the argument doesn't strictly follow from, from the premises that are, that are laid to it. Okay, I think that's enough, except possibly for people's questions, about defensive systems. I said that a proper nuclear strategy would involve a mix of a defensive shield and proper kinds of retaliatory systems. Now, what would those retaliatory systems be? Unlike, unlike some of my libertarian friends who advocate strong defenses, uh, I argue for the abolition of land-based ICBMs, and we, we do so in the book. Uh, on the grounds that, well, on several grounds, uh, among them being that uh, they, there is not a real military need for them. Uh, now, this, this point can be argued by, by defense technologists, and I'll be glad to take questions on it if, if people have questions. But that uh, when you look at the pros and the cons, there is really not sufficient need to justify the expenditure of, of fixed-in-place, large-scale ICBM systems like the MX missile that the kind of targets that they are uh, called for to be used against, which are mainly heavily hardened Soviet missile silos, really do not make that much sense as, as prime targets. Now, that, that, may, strike, that may sound strange. Uh, the argument for that is twofold. One, assuming that the United States does not plan a first strike against the Soviet Union, against the Soviet Union then... If a, if, a, if a system is truly retaliatory, then most of the silos that the Soviet Union has now, assuming that they actually contain ICBMs, those ICBMs would have been launched in a first strike at the time that a retaliatory decision is made. And so empty silos would be there rather than full silos. And so to configure a very large percentage of your retaliatory force against empty silos doesn't really make a lot of sense if it really is a retaliatory force. Now, the counter-argument to that is made, well, the Soviets have developed and tested and, and we have watched from space with, with reconnaissance satellites exercises to reload those silos with, with new missiles. And so those, those still should be good targets. Uh, that's what's really in question, is whether those silos would be reloaded, whether there would be good targets there. Now, several of the, of the people that I respect greatly in the, in the nuclear field argue that it's very unlikely that there would be missiles in those silos uh, waiting for a retaliatory strike. And they argue, in fact, that what is known about Soviet missiles from reconnaissance satellites and other means of intelligence, in fact, is very little. That the Soviets have, for decades, very actively practiced all sorts of techniques of concealment and deception, and that it is very unlikely, it's, it's, that it is very likely, in fact, that U.S. reconnaissance satellites have observed and photographed silo reloading exercises because they want us to think that more missiles are going to be in those silos, and that, in fact, the rest of their missiles are probably not in silos. They're probably in all sorts of other locations that are not visible to reconnaissance satellites such as barns, uh, tents, caves, and all sorts of other sites that, uh, that cannot be seen uh, by reconnaissance satellites. It's very implausible to think that just because we, being, being honest and honorable people, put all of our missiles in known locations where they can be targeted in advance, it's, it's not really credible to think that the Soviet Union operates the same way, given all of its history and all that we know about it. <clears throat> 
So the argument is that instead of that, the best way to, to intercept a Soviet ICBM is not to try to hit a hole in the ground where it might or might not be, but to hit it once it's been launched. And that the, that the same investment that might go into hitting holes in the ground really ought to go into intercepting missiles that are on their way to hit you. So what kind of retaliatory systems does that leave? We argue in the book for a rel strong reliance on, on cruise missiles, on, on mobile small missiles that uh, are not vulnerable to being wiped out because they're sitting on the ground in a known location, and for uh, smaller submarine launch missiles with the idea that here you have forces that are largely invulnerable because they can move around, can't be targeted in advance, but at the same time use the modern advanced guidance systems and small warheads so they can be used in a morally precise way strictly against military targets. And there are, there are vast numbers of military targets in the Soviet Union other than concrete holes in the ground uh, that could and should be targeted, uh, some of which are targeted now, more of which could be targeted. Finally, because my time is running short, let me just say a few words about the third subject that uh, I want to talk about, and that is military alliances. I think most of you who are, who are Europeans or, or from, from other countries know that American libertarians have, have been strongly critical of the present NATO alliance, and I think for good reasons. There, there's nothing in principle that we can come up with wrong with the idea of mutual defensive alliances, particularly for small countries that are close to a hostile neighbor. So that if we were thinking about defense policy for, for small European countries, or let's say for any European countries that are, that are close together, that are not protected by large oceans, that have a large hostile neighbor nearby, a mutual defense alliance in that context among free societies in Europe makes a great deal of sense. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to, to allow free societies to be picked off one by one because they could be prevent a, present a strong front together. And it's that kind of logic that's extended to the United States as a partner of Europe, uh, saying that that same situation basically holds and that it is in the interest of the United States as a free society to maintain the present structure of the NATO alliance. Now, that present structure, uh, in fact, is, amounts to a form of welfare. We call it defense welfare, but that is what it amounts to. It is, for the first time this year, official U.S. government sources have identified the amount of the U.S. defense budget that exists essentially because of the NATO commitment, because of the troops on the ground in Europe, because of the troops that are committed to be brought into to Europe uh, in, in case of a Soviet invasion and because of other forces that are, that are there and that basically would not be needed if it were not for the U.S. commitment to NATO. And that amounts to well over $100 billion out of that $200 plus billion U.S. defense budget. And ladies and gentlemen, that, it is dawning on American taxpayers, not just libertarians, that that is a huge amount of money and that that money uh, if it continues indefinitely going to defend Europe, uh, is not available to defend the United States. The realization is also dawning that, it, that there are, are negative aspects as well as positive aspects to this idea of the United States gaining something real by spending almost half of its entire defense budget on defending its neighbors in Europe. One of those most important points is that this idea of the nuclear umbrella that the ultimate defense of Europe by Americans is the threat to launch a nuclear strike from the United States against the Soviet Union if the so-called conventional forces on the ground in Europe don't hold uh, a Soviet invasion. Well, you can get military opinions on both sides, but an awful lot of people don't think that the, the relatively modest number and extent of ground forces in Europe could hold against the Soviet invasion. And so that the only thing that is the real deterrent is the U.S. threat of, of World War III. Now, what that says, in fact, if you look at it from an American's perspective, is that the American citizens and American taxpayers are being asked to risk their own cities, their own country, uh, to defend their neighbors, whom we like and wish to continue being friends with, but that's, that's a lot to ask. It really is. 
Uh, and in terms of the principles that we talked about, about what the proper role of a free society's government is and, and how much can be, can be asked of people to do, I think you really have to say that uh, if we're thinking of, of moving European governments in the direction of being free societies as we're trying to do in the United States, that, that free societies ought to be defending themselves and not permanently dependent on someone else uh, for a large share, in fact, for the, for the ultimate uh, deterrent that they rely on. And what that means is that uh, if, if it turns out, and I think it does, that nuclear weapons are still the, the ultimate deterrent of a Soviet attack or intimidation of Western Europe, that means that Western Europe needs to have its own nuclear weapons under its own control, uh, and not have that tied into the United States government making the key decision or having a finger on the trigger. And it means that something that Europeans as well as Americans have to face up to and start arguing for uh, or figure out some way of doing it without nuclear weapons. My own technical and political judgment is that I don't see a feasible way to do that at the moment. There's a lot of, of neat high-tech gizmos coming out, but uh, I don't see that any of them yet is more cost-effective than, than properly structured nuclear forces. And so I think there's a, a big choice that uh, is going to have to be faced by Europeans in general, and including European libertarians. Same goes for Japan. Japan, like Western Europe, is an economic superpower, but it's a, but it's a military pygmy. And that kind of situation cannot continue indefinitely. World War II is long over. Free societies, like those speaking in broad terms of Western Europe and Japan, historically do not make war on one another. The empirical evidence is overwhelming that wars between pairs of free societies virtually never happen uh, since we've had free societies develop in the last 200 years. Uh, wars do occur between pairs of unfree societies, between free societies versus unfree societies. Wars virtually never occur between free societies. And so that we, as, as residents of relatively free societies, have the least to fear from other free societies having nuclear weapons. So we should not sit and quake in our boots about nuclear arms for West Germany or nuclear arms for Japan. We should encourage realistic self-defense with the most modern technology that's available for all free societies. The nightmare vision of the Soviets is not, per se, that... that uh, the U.S. would pull out of, of Europe, but that the U.S., uh, that, that Europe, and particularly Germany, would get its own nuclear weapons, and that the Soviet Union would face not just one nuclear superpower, but two or three or four nuclear superpowers. Uh, I think it, is, it should be our job as libertarians who are responsibly concerned about national defense to help make that nightmare for the Soviet Union come true. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. We've got about six or seven minutes for, for questions, so if you could keep them uh, brief. Uh, David, David Butler, could you possibly do the honors with passing the microphone around? Thanks. <laughs> Dean Armand first. In front. Um, <clears throat> Bob, there was, in one of your arguments, I thought I saw a weak point. I'd like to bring it up, not just as a criticism, but to offer a way you can strengthen sure, it. Good. Uh, and that was on the um, question of whether uh, setting up a um, Star Wars type of defense or an effective nuclear umbrella would cause the Soviet Union to therefore strike first before it was fully developed. And your argument was that, well, the United States went through a period in the 50s and 60s where it could have done that and it, it didn't, so therefore the Soviets really wouldn't be afraid of this. I, I think this in itself is a weak argument because, in the first place, we shouldn't underestimate Soviet paranoia. I know it's a mistake to underestimate American paranoia or British paranoia or anyone else's paranoia. Uh, so that's always a factor. Um, secondly, the United States has never said it wouldn't strike first. It shows no indication that it's going to make any such claim now, and therefore it's not totally paranoia. Uh, 
In the third place, the United States did use nuclear weapons first in World War II. In the 1950s and 1960s, United States and Soviet Union were not actively involved in a war, uh, direct confrontation anywhere. And uh, whereas when it wasn't a direct confrontation with Japan, they didn't hesitate to use it. So the Soviets uh, still might have, with some justification, uh, go through that thought process. Now, I think there's a better argument to use, and I'm really um, dismayed that it hasn't been used more because I got this from all places, a guy who works at the Pentagon on the Star Wars uh, technology. And when someone brought up this objection to him, he said, oh, but don't you understand that we give them the secret? In other words, everyone, everyone will be given the capability of having a nuclear umbrella so that nuclear weapons will become absolutely obsolete. And this is very important, because even apart from the fear of American aggression, what, why should the Soviets dismantle their nuclear uh, weaponry if they're afraid that uh, Pakistan or Iran or, or France or China is going to lob one on them? Good. Now, I think, I, think what, I agree with, largely with what Dean said. I think I would, I would not feel comfortable right at the outset giving the entire technology to the Soviets. I think what we are in fact are likely to see, the Soviet Union well, is well along in developing this sort of thing also. They may well not have as sophisticated a computer capability and some of the other things. Uh, they are further ahead in terms of living and working in space at the moment. Uh, but I, I basically agree that it's going to have to come to that, that everyone is going to have to have the technology uh, to do this and that the world will be far safer when they do. So. Thank you for the point, and I, th I think your other points were well taken about, about the argument, the weakness of those other arguments. Okay, good. Let me, let me make a comment on the first question first. There's an ambiguity about U.S. Re nuclear retaliatory policy. Uh, on the one hand, there's been a lot published that says that uh, the decision to push the button to launch nuclear missiles would only be made after uh, nuclear weapons had actually landed, you know, hit the ground and exploded in the United States. Uh, that seems to be... From, from what you can glean from unclassified sources, that, that is the declared policy in the event of a nuclear attack on the United States. However, however, and this is a very important however, under the, the policy of, of, of the nuclear protection for Europe, and this is what Dean was referring to, it is also declared policy that if the use, if, if an invasion of Europe, of Western Europe by the Soviet Union was not being held back sufficiently by whatever was deployed on the ground in Europe, then the United States does reserve the right unilaterally to launch a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union without a single missile having been launched against the United States first. So that, that constitutes a retaliatory in the sense of Europe, first strike in the sense of from the United States to the Soviet Union. So there's this kind of dual policy that's in effect and that I, I worry a lot about because that is the most likely way that the United States could get itself involved in a nuclear war is, is by getting into that kind of situation of having to go to the defense of Europe by using nuclear weapons first. Now, your second point was about mil what military intelligence and peacetime. We have a whole chapter in the book. Incidentally, there are, there are copies of the book for sale in the back of the room. We have what I think is, is one, of the, one of the most interesting and, and innovative chapters in the book that does cover military intelligence. Uh, in, in one minute, it's very hard to, uh, to try to summarize that. We do argue that some sort of military intelligence capability, intelligence in the sense of gathering information about the potential capabilities and intentions, intentions of enemies that have declared that they're your enemies, like the Soviet Union, is obviously needed and justified. Uh, what exactly are the limits on that is a tough question to decide. We try to do so in the chapter. We definitely argue against uh, covert action types of, of capabilities like the, like the CIA has historically carried out trying to prop up dictators and so forth. Uh, that's not intelligence anyway in the classical sense. True military intelligence 
I think is an integral and essential part of any kind of serious, credible defensive effort. You have to know what you're up against and try to psych it out in advance in order that you can buy, order, design and order and buy weapons that are adequate to the task. So, uh, but read the, read the chapter. Uh, again, about the, you, your argument about taking out any kind of weapons that could be used for a uh, first strike. A um, couple points on that. Is, is, it, is it wise to assure a ruthless enemy that, that you would never do that? Um, I mean, I'm not talking about threatening to do it, but silence is not a threat, and nobody would argue against uh, against people possessing guns because the mere possession of a gun is a threat. Um, secondly, and, 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 and I, I mean, so much of, of, of war is, and the avoidance of war is governed by fear. I mean, wars happen when one, one country uh, thinks that it's not in danger and thinks that and appears to be, be weaker and, and, and doesn't, doesn't realize it. Um, the second thing is, Along the same lines, um, well, of the retaliatory situation you were just talking about, I mean, would we really want if the Soviet Union all of a sudden launched a massive nuclear campaign against half of the world? I mean, would it really be in our interest not to, in some sense, retaliate? And, and that would be, in a, as you said, in, in a sense of first strike. I mean, I don't think it's inherently unreasonable to think that in a situation where the destruction of most of the world is involved that we that we wouldn't want to do that and wouldn't want to do that as as libertarians who are interested in in, in freedom those are those are good and thoughtful points Lita. the on the first i i spoke a little bit imprecisely in in talking about weapons which are inherently first strike weapons because as you as you point out by analogy just with that even with a handgun uh a weapon itself doesn't have any intentions. Uh, the intention is in, in whoever possesses it and, and how the possessor decides to use it. And so, it, strictly speaking, it, it is not true that, that, I mean, I suppose you, can, you, can, you could think of, of doomsday bombs or, or huge, dirty nuclear weapons that would only make sense, uh, well, even there, they, 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 they would be wrong to use probably under any circumstances, but they, they, could, they could be thrown back in retaliation or used in a first strike. So it's not really the characteristics of the weapon as such, uh, but it's rather the, the policy under which they'd be used. I don't, I don't think the, the first strike potential of a weapon like the MX is really an argument against having it, okay? I think if the decision for other reasons, and I cited some other reasons, and I didn't go into all of them, if the decision were made not to build or to cancel something like the MX, uh, which is characterized by propagandists, especially Soviet propagandists, as an evil first strike weapon, I think you could then, you could score some important propaganda points to the world by saying, look, uh, we don't have weapons that, that people characterize as first strike weapons. We only have weapons that are designed more precisely to use against military targets. So you could score some propaganda points by that, but that's not the reason to do it. Uh, now, your other point about uh, if half of the world were, were about to be wiped out by, the Soviet, by Soviet nuclear attacks, should the United States do something about it? I, I, hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that particular scenario before. I think there could certainly be a case uh, for, for doing so, uh, just simply on the grounds of it, of it being like a, like a raging epidemic that was about to be out of control, uh, and that any reasonable person would, in, under, under a kind of a lifeboat ethics, would have to take some action uh, in that situation. Uh, I think you'd want to, to look at, in, in actually trying to design and plan and order military forces, look at whether there was any reasonable likelihood of that scenario uh, before deciding you needed to gear up uh, to, to do it. On the other hand, it, it may be that you would, you'd have the capability anyway, justified for other reasons, so that it would be available to use. In fact, I think you probably would uh, simply uh, to be able to retaliate against that kind of attack on yourself, uh, you might well have that capability available. Then it would just be a, a decision of, is now a justified time to use it? I think it probably would. 
but I'm, I'm willing to listen to arguments. Thanks. Bob, thank you very much.